in high conflict, any intuitive common sense thing you do to try to fix it will probably make it worse. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Square Cast. This is Vanessa Rouse. Thanks for joining us for High Conflict with Amanda Ripley, author of, you guessed it, High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. Amanda's book is, I believe, a gift to all Americans during this time of high conflict in our nation. But really, it goes beyond that. This book helps us with any type of conflict, with loved ones, at work, at school, at home, or wherever. This program is presented in partnership with Florida Humanities as part of the Created Equal and Breathing Free podcast series that will air right here on Village Squarecast through the end of the year. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our facilitators, Liz Joyner, founder and president of the Village Square, and Javita Woodrich, Village Square board member. All right, here's Liz to get us started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and president of the Village Square. On behalf of the Village Square and Florida Humanities, we're delighted you've joined us tonight for High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out, an evening with New York Times bestselling author and investigative journalist, Amanda Ripley. The program is the first in a multi-year series of digital programs called UNAM, America Reignited, that we'll present with Florida Humanities, where we'll explore the past, present, and future of the American idea as it exists on paper, in the hearts of our people, and as it manifests or fails to manifest in our lives. Over to you. Vita. Well, I am thrilled to be with you all this evening. It's an honor to be a part of the Village Square, whether it's a participant, um, clearing plates, Uh, facilitating, um, being on the board, all of it is just a tremendous honor because we do really extraordinary work. And I'm just so thankful for Liz. She's a a personal friend and mentor, and it is um, just a wonderful thing to be a part of this. And it's so special to have Amanda joining us. So I'm going to give a little bit of a biography. I know many of you read this online, but wanted to share a little bit about her before we get into our questions this evening. So it's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Ripley. Amanda is an investigative journalist with The Atlantic and a New York Times bestselling author. Her books include, of course, we'll be discussing tonight, High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. The How We Get Out, I think, is what most of us are are most interested in at this point. So I'm excited about the bulk of the conversation, kind of talking through that. Uh, The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. I believe Liz Joyner is one of those smartest kids. So really, uh, ideally, you wrote the book about her, Amanda. I invite her to (laughs) tell it later, right? Um, And The Unthinkable, Who Survives When Disaster Strikes and Why. Very profound work. She has written extraordinary feature stories on how journalists could do a better job covering controversy in an age of outrage on the least politically prejudiced town in America. And I am not going to tell you what town that is. You will have to find that out from Amanda yourself. And on the strange history of state laws that punish teenagers for acting like teenagers, which I never did, so I have no need for those laws. Uh, Her work has appeared in Time Magazine, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Slate, Politico, among others. And Amanda has appeared on what reads like the ABCs of uh, networks, Uh, on TV, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, and NPR. She has spoken at the Pentagon, the Senate, the House of Representatives, the Department of State, and the Department of Homeland Security. And there's a documentary based on her book, The Smartest Kids in the World, that was just released on the streaming network Discovery Plus. 
And you can go to amandaripley.com to learn more about Amanda and also subscribe to her newsletter called Unraveled. And we highly recommend that. And so we are thrilled to welcome Amanda with a gorgeous background. And I want all of you to know it's not virtual. It is real. This is a lovely (laughs) space that she's in for this evening. Thank you so much for being here, Amanda. We're so glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm having fun already, which doesn't always go this way. So. <laughs> Good. Good. We trust you with that compliment. And so I just want to ask the first very basic, but I know really critical question, which is what uh, what is high conflict? You kind of distinguish it from healthy conflict. So tell us a little bit about the difference between the two. Yeah. So about five years ago, after being a journalist for a couple of decades, I started to feel like journalism was broken. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't functioning the way it was supposed to function. And it felt like nothing made sense. Up was down, down was up. And anything I might do could make things worse as a journalist, Mm -hmm. right? Or have no impact at all, more likely. So I kind of went off on this gap year trying to make sense of the world, like a midlife gap year, the worst kind, you know, far fewer drugs. Um, right. And <laughs> I, of course, this one of my first calls was to Liz. And it's funny because I was looking back at my notes, Liz, from 2017, from when we first talked, and it's all still so true. It's like eerie. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so I just sort of went off trying to understand what was happening and obviously, you know, there's a lot of forces at work, which we've we've all heard a lot about already, including social change and social media and, you know, anxiety and demographic change and racism and lots of other things that really matter. And it turns out that the conflict itself really matters. So at a certain point, mm-hmm. conflict escalates to a point. It can in a it can be in a divorce, it can be in a civil war. The behavior is the same. It's when conflict escalates to a point where it takes on its own reality, it becomes conflict for conflict's sake. In high conflict, we make mistakes about ourselves, each other, and the problem. All of our normal biases become heightened. We literally lose our peripheral vision, (laughs) literally and metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And One of the most diabolical things about high conflict is that everyone suffers to different degrees, especially kids, actually, you know, whether it's political high conflict or marital high conflict, Mm. it's usually kids who who suffer the most. Mm. And you eventually start to mimic the behavior of your opponents without realizing it. So it's like, you know, it's this really hard to resist. There's a tug of high conflict. It's very hard to resist, but it has this, this really sort of perverse effect on people for all kinds of reasons. But anyway, so realizing that, understanding that, learning from people who study intractable conflict all over the world was really helpful as just an overlay to look at everything else that was happening. Mm. And I hope it'll be helpful to other people as well, because it used to be, I couldn't understand what was going on. And now literally, you know, I scroll through my phone and no headline surprises me. I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's a start, right? Yeah, I think it's a sign that you've nailed it, really. And and it starts to be predictive, right? You start to kind of go, there it is again, there it is again. And I've got a quote from the book that says, high conflict degrades a full life in exchange for moments of fleeting satisfaction. And the implications are physical, measurable, and punishing. And it feels like we feel that, right? Like all the time right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it's a tax, right? Spiritually, economically, physically. And it's so tricky because, again, it's, it's very human. It's very hard to resist. It's not unique to America or to this moment or to Twitter. You know, it, it's, um, there's a universality to it. And the difference is, you know, we, we are designing, we've designed too many of our institutions to cultivate high conflict. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty convinced at this point, I'm curious what you both think, that humans have the capacity for good, healthy conflict hardwired. Most of our greatest achievements as a species have been in good conflict. Right. Mm -hmm. We need conflict. We need to be able to be pushed and to push each other and defend ourselves and get better. 
You know, uh, I have a friend who says conflict is the greatest shortcut to transformation. You need it. But you can design a family, a church, a government to cultivate good conflict with rituals, habits, muscle memory for that, or <laughs> to cultivate high conflict. And, and so that's, that's sort of where we're at is we've, we've got to cultivate more of the, of the healthy kinds of conflict, which can include anger and can include frustration and sadness and all of those things. The, the distinction is usually pretty clear. The more you notice it, the distinction is um, things like contempt, disgust, loathing. Those are things that are indicative of high conflict and um, tend to backfire on us. You talk about how we need more good conflict. And one of the things that I've noticed is it feels like if you're a young person, you've had almost no modeling that shows you what good conflict looks like, you know, outside of your home, maybe, but sort of in our public space, it feels like there's nothing to look at and nothing to, to model. And then on top of that, you made a comment that, that really, if we do what is kind of natural to us in a conflict that is escalating, it, what we do, if we do what is intuitive, we're almost always doing the wrong thing. Right. That's the that's one of the for me most helpful insights, just in my own personal life and professionally, is is in high conflict, any intuitive common sense thing you do to try to fix it will probably make it worse. And so it's so annoying, right? <laughs> but so then what? You have to do the counterintuitive thing, right? And do it really carefully. You have to lean into conflict, as some of the people I profile in the book put it. You have to lean into it. You have to get really curious about the understory of the conflict. What is really going on here? You have to ask different questions. Um, you have to slow down the conflict, literally uh, <laughs> slow it down. So there are ways to resist that magnetism of high conflict, um, which is, is actually intellectually and emotionally really, really fascinating. Um, to to play with that and to try to to do it, and I frequently fail. But but there is definitely some hope in that paradox. You know, I I was just thinking as you were talking about this, and in, in in terms of some of the stories in the book, do you think that um, leadership or mentorship has a place in? And we'll go back to kind of more details about about high conflict, but in leading people out of it. So, you know, we have leaders in a lot of different kind of areas, identity politics or race or all of these things, but leadership in terms of moving people out of that space, just as you're talking, I'm thinking people need to trust someone that this is something that will work Mm -hmm. or that this is something that they can do. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of take a moment, just kind of in the hope space real quickly to, to ask you about that, like how it it snowballs forward. Yeah, no, I mean, I think how we got into this was partly because it it was modeled by national politicians and pundits um, on TV, right? So how we get out of it has to, in part, be that something else is modeled and, you know, a grassroots effort. So I think probably, right, would you agree that it has to come from like all different directions of people having some demonstration of what it looks like. And and I actually think there's, it's so funny what you said about how kids don't have an example of this. And that's true. In a lot of spaces, there is no example. But I actually think that probably in their like first or second grade classroom, there's more good conflict happening on average, if you've got a teacher who has classroom management skills, than there is in Congress, right? At this point. (laughs) Oh, for sure. So, so, you know, there's some of this in, in the air, and we have to sort of raise it up, put a spotlight on it. What was that like testifying to them, given that a good, a good amount of the, con- uh, the issue is there? Yeah. So uh, uh, last month, was it last month, I got a, a request from a, a House committee to, could I come testify about how Congress could get itself out of toxic conflict? Um, and I would have five minutes. <laughs> so that was <laughs> plenty. Of that was fun. <laughs> So on the one hand, it felt totally impossible, right? Like this is an institution designed with the binary Republicans versus Democrats, 
all kinds of performative humiliation, everything you would do if you wanted to create mm. high conflict, right? On the other hand, there were some surprising things that happened. So I was there with some, thank God, some other people who actually know about Congress. So I could be like, hey, <laughs> but uh, uh, I used to cover Congress, but that was a long time ago. So, uh, and Adam Grant is an organizational psychologist, and Bill Doherty from Braver Angels. So it was a good mix of folks. But what I noticed right away was, first of all, everyone on that committee, and so this is the House Select Committee on Modernization, and I say it because I want you to notice, if you want Congress to get itself out of toxic conflict, look up this committee, ask your member of Congress if they're not on it, you know, are they listening to this committee? Because these folks really, I do believe, are trying to do something different here. And here's the thing, they were all miserable, 100%. And this is actually a good thing. Because usually for people to get out of high conflict, they have to be pretty miserable. And everyone in this committee was desperate from everything I could tell to get out of high conflict. And they just don't know how. Um, there's no path. So it was not different from talking to you know gang members who want to get out of high conflict, from talking to spouses who are, want to get out of high conflict. It is this just exhaustion from the toll that it takes on you and on your soul, really. Mm. So that was good. And there's some basic stuff that they're not doing that you know you would do in any like rotary club dinner. I mean, you know, they don't have any space where they can have a conversation across the aisle without cameras there. Like literally there's no, mm. they never eat meals together. This one member of Congress said to me, he's like, you know, this place is so messed up. I don't even get to eat lunch, let alone with Republicans. <laughs> You know, because their hearings are scheduled back to back. And so it was it was sort of interesting that on the one hand it felt overwhelming, and on the other hand, it felt like there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that, that this committee at least is is mm. eager to try to pick. Well, it's interesting. This may be a slightly unpopular opinion, but when you think about what it's like to be to, you know, to run for a political office in a political party and how hard it is to move away from your group. The, you know, the more solid the group is, the more hard it is to move away from it, especially if you've, you know, that that sort of change back message is pretty strong and hard to do. Yeah, it is. And, and very lonely, you know. So when you see someone trying to get out of high conflict, if you can, you really want to try to, you know, accompany them because it's very hard to do. There was a um, freshman Republican from Georgia, uh, a woman who said, you know, as soon as I got, as soon as I won the election, I inherited thousands of enemies on Twitter from whoever was in the job before her, just because she had an R after her name, you know. And so just the way humans are wired, it is very hard not to feel threatened and act accordingly and really kind of close ranks with your group mm -hmm. when you're confronting that kind of reaction. Uh, you know, many of them, the day they won their election, the party on the opposite side announced who was would be running against them in two years. So again, these are design problems <laughs> that intentionally create dysfunction. I wanted to ask, uh, Amanda, I love that you have a glossary in the book. Um, and I think that can be so helpful because there are so many words, so many different meanings and connotations uh, that they can, they can take on. But can we talk about crockpots and the understory of a conflict, which you, I know, say is kind of potentially the interesting part or the most interesting part, but could you kind of define those things and then share a little bit about both of them? Sure. Yeah. No, I thinking. I don't know how to use a crockpot. So <laughs> I really don't know what it means at all. Yeah. I had a whole debate about <laughs> Should it be an Instapot? Should it be something else? <laughs> so yeah, so every, let's start with the crockpot. Every um, divorce attorney has a story or conflict mediator has a story about some possession like this that brought a divorce proceeding to a standstill because the husband wanted it, the wife wanted it, and no one would budge. And uh, in another case, it was the Legos. The husband wanted the Legos, the wife wanted the Legos, the kids' Legos, right? Um, now they could have obviously bought the Legos many times over with the amount they're paying their attorneys, um, but because it's not about the Legos, <laughs> it's not about the crockpot. In this case, the wife wanted the crockpot, the husband wanted the crockpot. If you ask different questions and listen in ways people can see, you might find out what the understory is. What is 
Every high conflict has a thing we fight about endlessly. And then the thing it's really about, right? So if you can get to what it's really about, and this is what I think journalists could do ideally is try to get to that understory of the conflicts that we're, you know, just kind of doing on infinite loop. In this case, the wife wanted the crock pot, it turns out. Uh, sometimes people don't even know, like it takes them a while to figure out what the understory is, but she wanted it because right. when, as a kid right. growing up, her parents had had a crock pot and every Sunday they would make, you know, a pot roast or something and it would smell really good all through the house. And to her, she'd put it on their wedding registry. And to her, it was like the symbol of the home that she'd wanted to create. And in reality, you know, they never used it. She and her husband didn't cook, mm. you know, it just wasn't their thing. So, but she still held on to that symbol, right? And that hope. And then what about the husband? Why did he want the crock pot? Well, he wanted the crock pot because she seemed to want it so badly, right? And he didn't even want the divorce. She did. Right. So it's a way for mm. him to claw back some, mm. <laughs> some autonomy. And, uh, you know, the, the reason to try to figure out what the understory is or what, what's underneath the crock pot in any fl- fight you're having, right, whether it's about masks or vaccines or, you know, how you load the dishwasher, to try to get to what it's really about faster helps you have the right fight. Mm-hmm. One of the things you notice is that we, we as, as humans, uh, God love us, we have a lot of the wrong fights with the wrong people and never have the fight we really need to have right? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to figure out what is that thing? Because there is something important that we disagree about here. And and often it is um, a need to belong, a a sense of a sense of importance, sense of mattering in the world, fear, humiliation, those are often the things that that are underneath. I've got this long term theory about the understory of our political disagreement from coming from sort of the center left politically and spending a decade and a half hanging out with a lot of conservatives who I love, one of the things I've come to understand is how much if you're conservative in America, you feel like you, you're you living in someone else's culture. Liberals, I think, sometimes don't really uh, understand how much it feels like they've won the culture. And I, th- I think that that really wears on you. And so like Vita and I were talking earlier today and, you know, about the frustration about masks and the disagreement. And, you know, sometimes you have to locate the frustration in a very long historical thread. And I think that that's mm-hmm. one that can explain it. Cur- curious what you guys think of that. Vita? I feel like you want to say something. <laughs> no, no, I am. I'm nodding curiously because I'm just glad to be here, like I mentioned before. No, but um, yeah, it, just to add what Liz said about our conversation, the idea that I think there are a lot of stories. I think maybe that tend at the at the in the season we're in to be on the left, where the the focus is: Do you not understand the context for this? For example, with race. Um, or gender equality, whatever, you know, one of these these key topics are that are contentious and understandably so. And then that you see with, I think, some of the emotional toll that presumptions about racism or bigotry or about uh, homophobia or whatever, the, again, that um, kind of presumption about somebody's character or kind of the core of who they are, how that has potentially taken a toll on the other, on that other side, which again, that binary is kind of false in a lot of ways, but how, you know, over time, how that erodes your ability to hear another individual or another side when it comes to the facts, Mm -hmm. if that's what you've continued to hear um, and so that there's there are stories, and I think sometimes even the word story people assume means something mildly fictitious, but that these are the real experiences of people, whether it's history, whether it's their own emotional weight that they've had to carry, or the humiliation they've had to carry because they've been called the names, they've been the presumptions have been there because they use words like patriotism or freedom or personal responsibility, and then on the other side, people who use BIPOC and bigotry, you know, whatever the thing is, but, but the idea there being that there's history to why people are behaving the way that they do and that they're bringing a lot to the table that in some way needs to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and how do you do that in a way that's not, you know, dumping your 50 pound 
luggage on the scale and Delta saying, I'm sorry, you can't take that on the plane. Um, and I just came out with that right away. And if everyone leaves the call, I apologize. It was a bad metaphor, but <laughs> no, I like it. I'm, I'm riding with you. <laughs> right. How do you, how do you talk about these important, the, the history, the weight yeah. that people have borne yeah. without shutting down curiosity and conversation? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's something I think a lot about, you know, like I know I'm guessing you both have, you, you mentioned some of them. There's like this never ending, I'm always adding to it, list of words I can no longer use. It's true. It's almost by the month you lose yeah. new words that it just gets more and more narrow. And when you try to, right. you're wanting to speak to a large group of people, you find it's yeah. really hard to do. Right, 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 right. Like a mixed group of people. It's getting like narrower and narrower, and it's it's also kind of haunting because I know there are words that I do use sure. that people hear differently than I intend. All the same, you know, my list is not comprehensive, and so I'm going to have things that I I say and people hear differently. And it reminds me of there's a great quote that is like the biggest mistake in communication is thinking it happened. So we are just even without all of these layers, right, of legacies, of status, of uh, hierarchies, of, of race and gender, and even without high conflict, we're really bad at communicating. A, with ourselves, like knowing our own emotions and being able to like really figure out if, if we're just responding, we're just justifying our gut reaction or if what's going on. And then conveying it to someone else, especially across a divide, is something we're really, really, really not as good at as we think. And, and I think that's, that there's a great study that came out about Facebook and people who post political comments on Facebook and, and they ask people who do that what their goal was. And they said it was to inform. It was like an act of service. Mm. And then the followers who see the posts do not feel like it is to inform as an act of service. Huh. They feel like it's an opinion and they're often not, not wanting the opinion in that forum. So there's a, just a total disconnect in the intent and the way it's received. So it, it's a huge, huge challenge, right? To, to how do we have these conversations without hitting a tripwire mm. that shuts it down? Yeah, so I there's a question from the audience. It's what are some of the words you choose not to use to avoid polarizing? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking it would take out almost the whole program, right? <laughs> well, okay, you you both go. What what are words that you? And then I'll, I'll go as well. This could be a drinking game. <laughs> so making sure that conservatives feel very invited to our programs, we we try to not wor use words that are super squishy. Yes, and. And, and super uh, touchy-feely. And that's not because conservatives are in any way not warm and everything. It's, it's, it's actually Jonathan Haidt's um, moral foundations theory. And, um, and our audience has knows John and he's been, he's visited us. Um, and the fact that liberals speak in care and fairness language and in this kind of high conflict environment, conservatives hear those words and kind of go, yeah, I don't think that that's for me. So that that's one whole set of things that we try to focus on. We try to find other words mm. it's like the word dialogue right there you dialogue, go right yeah. mm -hmm. the word peace mm -hmm. kindness <laughs> yeah yeah um and, and it really it's not it isn't because it's because of the high conflict right it's taken over right right it's because it it people hear a bunch of things uh, underneath that right and actually for my book because i generally lean left like a lot of journalists at least that places I write for, you know, I have different people read books in advance to see what are they hearing that I don't intend? Um, they may not agree with everything. That's fine. But I want to intend that, right. you know, I want to know that it was on purpose, not by accident. So I had all kinds of people, you know, people of different races, different ages, very important, different parts of the country. Um, and then I had a conservative who is in the book, uh, a Trump supporter named Caleb, who is featured at the end of the book, who ends up going on this exchange. He's a corrections officer in, in rural Michigan, and um, he ends up going on this sort of unusual exchange with a group of very liberal New York Jews who come and stay in his home, and then he goes to their place. Anyway, 
we got, to, you know, we got to be friends over this process of reporting on this. And he is super busy, works like double shifts, like a lot of prisons are understaffed all over the country and he has little kids and still, you know, he offered to read the draft. And when he, he did, it was so great because the conversation, we ended up having like a six hour conversation over several days about his notes. And it was so great because we had the relationship, which you both know how important this is because we had the relationship. We could laugh about the different ways we were hearing these words. Just a quick example. He said, uh, at some point I used the word problematic and he was like, Oh my God, liberals are always using this word. And I was like, really? And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, just be specific. Like, what is it you mean? Don't say pr- this is problematic. So I took it out and changed it. There are other things that, you know, he disagreed with that I didn't change, but it was sure. really good to know what they were, you know? And we actually had a really fun conversation about what he heard, what I meant, And there was a lot that I could fix instantly because it was not what I intended. And then there were other things that were kind of in the gray zone. So that's an example of where relationship, to answer our our conundrum here, (laughs) if there's some relationship, even just a little, right, you can withstand some of the miscommunications and even, even when they are offensive, you know, you can sometimes in the right context you can explain why it's offensive and then yeah. you can reconcile. So actually that's really one of the things I like best about your book is I just think you've done an extraordinary job of making these incredible concepts, very concrete and tangible and workable. And, and I do want to say before I ask you this question, just God bless Gary Friedman I I do not know how you were able to find such an exceptional person to help you tell the story the, who basically kind of invented mediation. It was like he, he's a leader, Jedi master of conflict management, and somehow managed to get in his own conflict trap. Mm-hmm. And one of the metaphors in the book that I think is just the most powerful thing, and I will never even, I will never turn on the TV again to listen to the news without thinking of the La Brea Tar Pit. So, so I want you to share with people just a little bit of, you get that picture in everybody's mind when we're walking towards things about whether we really want to keep walking towards them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Gary um, helped invent the field of legal conflict mediation in the seventies. He was just sick of the adversarial us versus them nature of traditional law. And so he, a couple came to him, he, he was friends with them and they said, can you help us with our divorce? And he did his usual thing. He said, well, I could represent one of you, but the other would need to get an attorney and all the platitudes that he'd always said. And they just were so disappointed and frustrated. And they were like, why can't you just help us in the same room? Just you. And so he decided to try. And this was really not something that was done very often before then. In fact, the uh, California Bar Association investigated him because they figured there must be something really shady about this. Um, But they got through it and discovered that they could, in the same room, without an us versus them, high conflict binary setup, come to an agreement. It wasn't always easy, but it, I'll tell you what, it was a lot cheaper and a lot less painful than the traditional system. And then, yes, a few years ago, his neighbors urged him to run for office in his tiny town in Northern California. And as he put it, it took him about an eighth of a second before he got sucked into high conflict himself uh, of the political variety. And yeah, he is, I'll tell him you said that because he is an incredible person who not only, you know, went through this, realized what had happened, and then, you know, course corrected and got himself back into good conflict, but told the story, you know? Yeah. And did the non-intuitive thing a lot of time along the way. He did the not, totally the uncomfortable thing. Um, And, and, and then was willing to tell the story publicly in the book, which is just, you know, really to his credit. So, but the La Brea Tar Pits, I'm so glad you like that, uh, that you like that analogy. So this is a place right off Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles, you know, down the street from an international house of pancakes. And it looks like a little lake, but it's actually a um, natural asphalt pit, basically, that's been gurgling up from the ground since the last ice age. Uh, And scientists have found more than 3 million bones trapped in the depths of this asphalt including, you know, skeletons of 
more than 2000 saber tooth tigers in this patch of ground. Like that's crazy, right? It's like a living quagmire. Um, so the question is, how did this happen? How did all of these predators, sloths, all these mammoths, you know, get, get stuck in this ground? Well, it turns out that something like tens of thousands of years ago, a large mammal, probably a bison lumbered into the tar pits, got stuck in the asphalt and started grunting in distress, which attracted predators, right? Like wolves, which were delighted to come up across the stuck bison. And then they got stuck and then it went on and on and slowly the carcasses would sink. So this is a metaphor for high conflict. It is, it is a trap, just like the Librea tar pits. And it draws us in for totally natural reasons, but it's very hard to get out once you get in and it gets more and more crowded every day. So um, that's what happened to Gary. More and more sound and more and more people coming to it. And, and that is, does feel like what it is. Yeah, it's a trap, you know, but there's a great quote by China Mieville, the author, he says, a trap is only a trap until you recognize it's a trap. And then it's a challenge. <laughs> so, you know, you got to know you're in a trap. Otherwise you're just, you know, you're just another wolf. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Well, and I, I know about the liberty. I was really impressed with myself when I was reading the book because I know of the tar pits from Volcano, the 1997 movie featuring Tommy Lee Jones, nice. in which the tar pits become a massive volcano because I have an incredible uh, sense of taste when it comes to <laughs> entertainment. But <laughs> speaking of volcanoes out of tar pits, because that's really kind of what happens with us. You know, what makes a conflict explode, right? So it's healthy conflict doesn't explode in the way that high conflict does. So you talk about these four fire starters, you know, in, in the book. Um, and I'd love for you to kind of identify those for people. And, and I would encourage, because I know uh, Liz and I, as, we, as we've talked, you know, for the audience to do this, I, I've really had to work hard to not think about all the other people in my life who do do the things that are in the book. Because, you know, when I first started it, I thought, wow, there are about 30 people I can think of off the top of my head who need this book. (laughs) (laughs) And I hadn't even gotten to the part about looking at it within myself. So I know that's a big part of it, but I think as we move along, that's something I'm really working to do. And I appreciate your encouragement in that to kind of look at not just on that larger scale, but even internally in our day-to-day experiences, what this kind of fire starting reality looks like, because we are. Watch out if Vita gives you a copy of the manuscript. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> yeah. 30 special individuals who I know who I think should deserve it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. It is um, it is so tempting. It's always the people who most need to read a book that don't read it, right? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> so yeah, there, so there, yeah, I, there are, there do seem to be predictable patterns for the conditions that create high conflict. So there's four that I think are sort of most underappreciated. And these are the things to watch out for and to avoid at all costs if you want to stay out of high conflict, if you want to stay out of the tar pits, right? So the first one is binary group identities, sorting the world into opposing camps, right? In reality, most humans do not fit neatly into, particularly, you know, you can't put 70 million Americans in one bucket uh, as we do right now, politically. Mm -hmm. It's madness. Like it doesn't, it's not how humans work and you don't know them and they don't know you. So binary group identities, um, humiliation is uh, probably the most powerful underappreciated force in every high conflict I've ever seen, whether it's gang violence or domestic violence or a diplomatic standoff, humiliation is lurking underneath. So that's a big one we could talk more about, uh, but also corruption. So when institutions are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, that's, that's a time when you might see high conflict for lots of reasons. And the last one is conflict entrepreneurs. So these are people or companies that exploit conflict for their own ends, right? This is the one where we could probably all think of someone, um, someone who just seems to delight in every twist and turn the conflict takes. Sometimes this is for profit, but just as often I found it's for a sense of connection, 
of belonging, a mm-hmm. uh, sense of power, attention. Mm-hmm. So those are just as powerful as money, right? If not more, depending on the situation. So noticing who conflict entrepreneurs are is hugely, hugely helpful. And if possible, putting some distance between between you and them. Everyone I followed, you know, Gary, we talked about one of the first things he did once he realized that he had basically lost two years of his peace of mind to this conflict in this little town. He he stopped relying on a sort of veteran organizer from the political world for his advice. And he started relying on his wife. <laughs> so his wife was beloved in the neighborhood and just saw everyone as three-dimensional, flawed, beautiful humans and not as mm. either in one, either you know, for me or against me, the way Gary had started to. So distancing yourself from conflict entrepreneurs in your Facebook feed or on your TV or in your circle can be a really important first step. And should you become a conflict entrepreneur in order to <laughs> properly address the other? Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, this is actually, <laughs> I'm stop. so glad you asked but me. But I think this that's probably a reality. Say. Yeah, no, yeah. this is important to say because we can all be conflict entrepreneurs. Oh. And I know as a journalist, I'm sure I have been, and I'm not proud of it. It's so tempting, right? Like it's a, it's, it's just an easy shortcut You know, you can write a rant, you can be sarcastic, you can be dismissive. These are all, these are all, you can describe, this is another classic move of a conflict entrepreneur, describe something as a war that's not a war, Mm. right? Those kind of cheap shots, uh, grandiose language like that are are sure signs of conflict entrepreneurship, but we are all all definitely capable of it. And Mm. there's a great quote from, I just read this book about conflict entrepreneurs in in organized religion, in churches, there's a lot of, in congregations, mm. <laughs> this is, turns out to be not exempt from this problem. And um, the author said, I'm going to, the quote is something like, he calls them well-intentioned dragons. He doesn't call them conflict entrepreneurs, but he calls well them well-intentioned dragons. dragons. And I think that's the name of the book, actually. I recommend it. And he says, the first rule of dealing with dragons is don't become one. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's because you will your instinct, your the intuitive thing will be to start playing the same game. And yes. then next thing you know, you're it creates an equilibrium, right? Yeah, exactly. Fire with it's fire. In the yang and it, it's how you create balance. Of a sort. And, and yeah. you've got to try, yeah. It you got to try to do something different. Yeah. Um so you just you just answered a question that that um, someone from the audience asked, do you think politicians and journalists too are exploiting the magnetism of high conflict? Um, because that's the way they can provoke us. Um, emotions in us that make us choose them. Mm -hmm. Even if some of them try to do something different, how can that movement grow until it generates a turning Mm. point? Hmm. Right. Until there's like a critical mass of people and then there's like a tipping point. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the really tricky things about high conflict is a small number of people get louder and more righteous about their own moral superiority and then most a larger group of people go silent Mm -hmm. and you see that in the united states right now so two out of three americans say they have political opinions they're afraid to share half of americans have stopped talking to someone because of something they said about politics so you see this silence that's happening at the same time you know, the extremes are getting louder and louder Mm. and it feels like everyone's screaming at each other, but actually that's not exactly what's happening, right? It just feels that way because of the distortion of social media and news media. So, so this is really, this is just as big a problem, right? The screaming at each other is a problem, but also the silence because those, those political opinions don't go away, you know, they just get suppressed. And the less time we spend with each other, the more entrenched it becomes because we don't have any counter information right. that, that violates whatever it is we want to believe about you or what the conflict entrepreneurs want us to believe. Right. We don't get pushed. We don't get challenged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, it's amazing. I'm not sure I've met a single person who I've gotten to know just a little bit who didn't defy my expectations of them in a two-dimensional way. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are hard to hate close up. And you don't really even need to be that close up, just like, you know, sharing a meal and some casual talk 
uh, you know, knowing that you both have kids, you know, who are at the same school, things like that. It, it always changes things. And the further apart we are, the worse this gets. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes you like every day I wonder what am I missing? Like, what am I missing by not having those conversations? Mm -hmm. You know, I get to have some of them for my job, but you know, just look, I live in Washington, DC. It's just, you know, 97% of people here voted for Biden. Like it's a very homogeneous politically on national politics, very homogeneous place. And so what am I missing? And, and I know there's so much, you know, and, uh, and I think it's like, you, you only need a few encounters like that to realize, oh man, there was a lot I was missing. And then you start to get curious, right? And I know you've seen this, you've, you've literally seen it in front of your, your face at, at your events. I remember you said to me when we spoke, Liz, a few years ago, you know, one thing I think it's really easy to get confused about, you said, is that a lot of people think of this as being an informational problem. And you said, we believe we have a relationship problem. Yeah. So true. We, we still definitely believe it. And the thing that's amazing about it is the, the relationship problem is easier to fix. So a lot of times we feel like, you know, we're sort of mucking around in the wrong place, looking for the solution where it's hard to manage. The relationship problem isn't that hard if you do it people to people. Mm -hmm. And I've always been better for those relationships when I had that opportunity. Yeah. And it's not always positive, right? Like there are moments that really sure. can be sort of painful and wistful or dispiriting and then encouraging. And then it's like this really complex galaxy of emotions, those encounters. But I do think when people have them, they want more of them, which is, you know, which is encouraging. Yeah. Um, so I'm pulling a couple of questions from our audience and and this is from Lindsay, who uses your book and her college course on civil dialogue. And I know Lindsay, and she's really extraordinary. She's a professional. She wanted to know if you had suggestions for activities and lessons for college juniors and seniors. Oh, fun. Maybe, maybe there could be an addendum. Yeah, how fun. Yeah, so one Our thing. Heterodox Academy, too, is we, we have a whole uh, couple of Amanda Ripley slides. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so. One thing that I do, I just did a, a class with some, um, in this case, they were young women, mostly high school, some college who, who might want to run for office someday, um, part of a training. And we did a listening exercise. So in the book, I talk about this uh, form of active listening that Gary trained me on called looping for understanding. And it's basically a way to literally show people you have understood what they have said or show them that you're trying to understand. Um, so you don't need to pair it back exactly what they say, but as soon as you hear something that seems important to them, not to you, um, you try to distill it into the most elegant language you can muster and check if you got it right. Okay. And it is not intuitive. And I tr I've trained hundreds of journalists on this and they are at first universally terrible at it, even partly because they think they're really good at listening. And, but within a half hour or so, you can get people to start really delighting in the challenge of it. So that's, that's one I would definitely recommend. And these, these young women were great. I mean, they said, uh, what did one of them say? She said, um, you know, I've, I've always, I spend all my time when I'm, when someone's talking to me, thinking of what I'm going to say next, but this forced me to really be present, you know, in a way that, you know, no amount of meditation <laughs> had succeeded. So it is a, it is a very different way of, of being that I think opens up conflict. So that would be one thing for sure. That's great. Yeah. One of the things that we talked about is just the questions. It is amazing how you, if you start to just shift how you're interacting into questions and you just have some beautiful questions that you have listed out, what is oversimplified about this concept? What do you want to understand about the other side? What would it feel like if you woke up and this problem were solved? What is the mm. question no one is asking? What a great question that is. Where do you feel torn? Um, and even just tell me more. And it's, it's just amazing how infrequently we seem to interact in a way where it will pique our curiosity and we will learn something that we didn't know before. 
Yeah, yeah. And you have to have, I mean, I have those questions that we compiled them for journalists and anyone can use them. I have them on my wall. Um, and it's good to just have them in your pocket so that, especially when mm -hmm. someone says something that you didn't expect, that maybe you find offensive, to be able to just whip one of those questions out is so important because it's really hard to think in a moment like that. Like it's, it's yeah. you know, you get reactive. Um, for me, if I'm interviewing someone for a story and they start saying something offensive that I find offensive, I just, what I notice about myself is I just want to end the interview. Like I just want to shut it down. Um, and this isn't a live interview. That would be a different situation. This is just me and the person. And uh, I, I just have an instant recoil. Like I just want out of this situation. It, it is, it is not cognitive. It's just immediate limbic system reaction. And Gary and others uh, that I, you know, I've done a lot of mediation training and I'm still work. I'll be working on this till the day I die. But part of what I'm working on is to notice that reaction, take a breath and realize this is the good stuff, right? I mean, it depends on the situation, right? If you're in physical danger, that's another situation, right? It depends on whether you are protected in some way. Like if you can stand your, you can stand in the space you're in. But if you can, this is the good stuff, right? Like this is where I really want to loop. I really want to get curious. This is like the ultimate use of those skills. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but that's the whole point, you know, um, is to not flee the scene necessarily. What do you, you know, if you were thinking about sort of that, I, I, what I, one of the things I appreciate in the book and even in what you're talking about now is you talk about you and a friend all the way up through global sized or nation, you know, nationwide um, schisms or concerns, because there are times where people think I can't possibly change anything outside of my sphere of influence or don't even realize that they have a sphere of influence, right? So they're going to continue, you know, I do this, I continue in some of the behavior that I have because I don't even recognize myself in the book or in things that I'm reading because I don't see myself having that kind of value. And really it's every individual having this sense of ownership of the kinds of things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about this on, on that smaller kind of micro scale, whether it's with family, friends, or work, but kind of that smaller scale, and you think about when people are in the peak of high conflict and the need to sort of de-escalate and move into some of the, the what you're talking about, um, which, like you said, is a lifelong process. If somebody's really starting out mm. in this space, do you have any thoughts about really kind of moving in the right direction? Yeah. Yeah. So I think any kind of active listening training, any kind, is worth doing. It doesn't have to be looping. It doesn't have to be in person. I mean, you know, ideally it's in person and you can practice, but that is, that is like the skeleton key that opens up every door. So, and if you can, and this is the important thing you got to So Chris Voss, who's a former FBI hostage negotiator, he's been on like every podcast ever. You may have heard him. Um, he's got a great, like, you know, New York accent and, uh, but he, <laughs> he calls it tactical listening, right? There's, have you noticed this? I found you can you can make squishy sort of feminine words okay for different audiences <laughs> if you just add the word tactical. tactical. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, in my first book on disasters, I talked about the importance of breathing uh, in extreme duress. This is also true in conflict, right? Um, it's the only way we can access our sort of involuntary reaction uh, is sort of rhythmic breathing. And I, I actually did the same thing, but I borrowed a term from the military, which is combat breathing. <laughs> so if you add the word combat, oh, whereas what if I had said Lamaze breathing? Like that would have been, <laughs> I would have lost a lot of people. So it's messed up, but you do what you can do. And then, so then that kind of listening, I think is, is really, really key. But what he says, and he's right, is you have to practice that listening in low stakes environments all the yeah, time there you, go. you can't just bust yep. it out like when you're in a big fight with your family <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> like that <laughs> right. you got it practice it literally every day so anytime anyone says anything to you with any amount of emotion even like just a tiny smidge so i use it when i interview academics about their research so there's no conflict 
but they care deeply right. about it, right? So I'll try looping them. I'm building rapport. I'm also making sure I'm understanding what they're saying because you'd be amazed how often you know I'm wrong, you know. And uh, and they really open up. Like it, it changes. It's a physical shift you see in people. Another great way to practice it is it is with little kids. If you have little kids in your life, because they're constantly arguing with you. There's always conflict, right? You tell them to take a shower. You tell them to you know eat their vegetables and. I mean, with my son, I used to get really pulled into this and I could, he, he would be happy to spend 23 hours arguing. <laughs> and so, or I just try to like lay down the law and be the authority and that didn't work. And, but if you just say, so you really feel like taking a shower is just an utter waste of your time. And, you know, your friend doesn't have to do it and you shouldn't have to do it either. It's just ridiculous. Is that right? And it's amazing because he'll say, Yes, exactly. And then he goes, takes a shower. Takes a shower. <laughs> you know, so it's it to be heard. What like half Seen what people heard. need is to be heard. It's not enough. It's not everything, right? I mean, we also need right. basic civil rights and we need other things. But in in day-to-day encounters, it's it's way undervalued. It is people need right. to be heard before they will listen. So here's a question from Rachel. Rachel, we missed you in Tallahassee. When is it worth stepping out of a relationship because of the level of conflict? How do you manage, address, transform power imbalances within conflict? Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's one that comes up a lot in different contexts. I don't know if Rachel's talking about an interpersonal conflict or, you know, a sort of political conflict or social conflict, but there are certain conflicts you can microdose right? Like you maybe have a relative who really, really just gets on your last nerve, but you don't necessarily want to sever the relationship. And so you can have like (laughs) measured exposure. But then there's other people who the conflict really is toxic, right? Or they're, they're not, they're not interested in reciprocating any kind of listening. Um, They're not interested in good conflict. They're interested in high conflict. And there are people who are known as high conflict personalities who really have a lot of inner unresolved conflict and will just keep spreading it around, right? There's a, a place actually called the High Conflict Institute with a couple of attorneys and mediators who focus on high conflict personalities. So if you're dealing with someone like that, I would strongly recommend checking out their books. The William Eddy, E-D-D-Y, is the, is the author of a lot of those books. Um, but that's, that's fairly rare. A lot of those people have personality disorders. That, that's relatively rare. So then it's like, okay, well, what if there is a power imbalance, which I know Rachel mentioned? One thing I think a lot about, and I hope this doesn't sound too squishy, let's call it combat, <laughs> combat thinking. Uh, basically. There's the, it's just like in sports, right? Oh, sports, sports should help us here. There's the the game as it's played, the external game, right? There's the gear, your opponent, who, who scored how many points. Then there's the internal game, right? Which any athlete knows both of these things, you can't separate them. And they're both super important, right? The inner game, the outer game. The same is, tr- is true with conflict is what I'm starting to believe that There are conflicts where I cannot, I cannot affect the way the other side is behaving and they're not fighting fair and they're, they do have more power and they are not playing by the rules. And that is diabolical. And I want to, you know, keep working and organizing and protesting and doing all those things to change that. In the meantime, I don't want to fall into high conflict in my own head. Right. So just like if I were trying to get out of a toxic marriage, and maybe the my uh, you know soon to be ex has a lot more money than I do. He has fancy lawyers. He's manipulative and narcissistic. Maybe this is, by the way, not talking about my actual husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> sorry, but that was good. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, but I'm saying as an analogy, if if you were in that situation, you would be uh, you know it would be understandable for you to fall into high conflict, for you to start losing sleep over this conflict, for you to really feel like it's us versus them situation for you to talk about it that way with your kid, right? It would really start to consume you, right? And I, I mean, sure, that would happen to me. But what you want to do is to not fall into that for your own 
sake and for your kids, right? Um, so that internal fight is the one thing we can control and try to resist the the magnetism of high conflict because mm. we will eventually start doing the thing that we went into the fight to stop mm. if we're not careful. Vita, you want me to throw one out? You've got one. Well, no, I think I thought something was interesting that someone said here. I think this is this is good. You know, how many people in your experience are really looking to be open-minded and to change? And, and I actually was reading something about this in the volunteerism landscape. There was a, a woman who was writing a post about corporate groups. And this is not any sort of diss on private the private sector. This is just kind of a case example. But a lot of groups that would come to her and say, we really want these diverse, equitable, inclusionary experiences. And then they would cancel and not tell her why. And once she finally got into some conversation, it was, we, she distilled it to, we really like the idea of this stuff, but then you're telling us stuff that's actually kind of difficult and uncomfortable for us to do. And it's not going to really look the way that we wanted it to on social media, basically. And this, again, she was not being disparaging so much as sort of saying, you need to ask the right questions ahead of time to be sure people are willing to make the sacrifice to make certain choices, right? So, how, you know, in your work, you know, what are you seeing, um, again, with, you know, with language, all of those things, there are people, we we all say the right things, but in terms of that, the heart change or whatever you want to call it, that really happens, yeah. you know, big picture, and then also little picture, what are you really seeing from people in mm-hmm. terms of their desire to grow in in healthy conflict versus kind of that, you know, that's a great idea, but, but I kind of like it over here. I, I miss soap operas, daytime, you know, I was a young and the restless kid. Um, you know, some people, <laughs> that pull is there, you know, what are you seeing in terms of people's honest desires in this space? Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I do think everybody wants someone else to do it. Right. But, it, but, but you know, everybody feels, most people feel like it's other people who are the problem. I do think relationship, again, is really important. It doesn't need to be like, you know, lifelong friends, but any kind of just, you know, tenuous connectivity can make people more open to that discomfort, right? But if you're coming in and there's no relationship, yeah. Um, And it feels like obligatory or something we have to check a box and just say we're doing and there's no human connection, then it's really hard, right, to get that um, unless people have to, you know, really have to. Now, I will say it doesn't take much, right, to to lose this point to get that human connection. You know, I remember going to my first, I I should probably not tell the story, but I'm going to tell you, the first Braver Angels event I went to, uh, you know, back in like 2016 or something. And I was covering as a reporter. So I had that comfortable remove from the event. And so this was, you know, half Democrats, half Republicans, and it was in an outer suburb outside of DC. And they did this fishbowl thing they do from marital therapy. I love fishbowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have the reds, you know, sit in the center and talk about, they answer the same few questions. It's like, what do you really like about your political affiliation? And, you know, what about it is right for the country? And then it's like, what gives you pause about what your party is doing? And anyway, they have this interesting conversation and the Democrats sit on the outside and listen, and then you switch and do the same thing. So I got to sit on the outer, outer ring the whole time because I'm a reporter. So, um, but I noticed something I didn't expect, which is when the Reds, the Republicans were speaking, Two of them, they were just really funny. Like they just, I just found myself laughing at their sense of humor, you know? And I actually felt it before I cognitively noticed it. Mm. And I remember feeling like, I really like these guys. And then feeling like, oh, that's weird. And then feeling like, what? It's weird. You can't like a Republican? What's up with you? Like, what is your problem? You know? And that's had this whole thing in my head that was really kind of, right. you know, I, 
<laughs> my husband, my husband is is much more conservative than I am. I thought I was somehow exempt from this whole bias, you know, <laughs> and and of course I'm not, you know. And so I had certain stereotypes going into that conversation, and the fact that they were funny broke down some of that resistance, even though I still disagreed mm-hmm. with them. You know, I'm sure on many things. I can't even remember what <laughs> those things were, right. but so you know, a little humor. A little connection goes a really long way, I, I think. I don't. What do you What do you both think? Absolutely, a long way. It's like it's surprising and disarming in, in a lot of ways. It it you know, sometimes I think that we have the problem we have because we don't spend as much time together, and yeah. if we simply did that. If we could find ourselves in spaces together more often, that um, much of this would fade away in just kind of a natural way. So. And I, and I do think when people think, you know, I have a three-year-old, I have a full-time job, you know, I'm married, I, I don't have a whole lot of time. And then we have, you know, a few things going on in the world. So sometimes when I'm, I'm, I'm listening to people talk about connection, I'm thinking of it meaning a for, more of a formal kind of organized way, right? But I'm in a job with 20 other people. I have existing friendships. I, you know, it's, it's not that I have to go out and do some sort of like extensive work to find the relationships. It's already typically there for people. It's more about, I think some of the, you know, the, some of those, those, you know, concerns like fear that you were talking about that are keeping you from maybe moving into a conversation. So, you know, I was talking with a group of friends just on text and somebody mentioned a daycare that a gal had her kids going to and another girl texted me on the side and had some things to say about the leanings the ideological leanings of that particular school right so when you you know when we're talking in this you know event about relationships and so on somebody may not think about that mm. but because i had been in the midst of reading your book amanda <laughs> i <laughs> was I thought to myself, all right, I have some choices about this parallel text conversation going on about my kids' daycare with a group text going on about people sharing about daycares because it was going. It wasn't, it wasn't like this, but it was like this in that space. And so the taking pause, which you know, text can be a problem, but it also can be beneficial because you have a moment. But that's a very basic thing that just is my ongoing life. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with like, okay, I'm going to have to go to a thing. Right, right. With right. A particular, you have to go to Habitat for Humanity. I've got to go to a, for a yes, I got to go to a restorative <laughs> justice summit in wherever for a week if I'm going to have good conversations with people. Right. Although that's a wonderful thing. Right, right. Um, and so I, I do think that that's part of it, and that's again why I really love what you're saying and what you talk about in your book is it's it's relatable information that is not that there are these special people who have that that are the only ones who can do this work because there is that barrier sometimes. Well, that guy on the Today Show is really cool or Amanda writes for the Atlantic and she's super cool. So she clear, I don't really have a lot of other adjectives right now besides cool, but you know, people think I'm not the person that is, is going to make that difference. I, I love that example from the text because there are these like we do. I mean, we do lament and I rightfully so that we are so segregated racially, geographically and also politically now. I mean, the rate of politically mixed marriages is down 50 percent mm-hmm. from when I was a kid. That's a huge change. Wow. And I think probably affects our polarization more than Facebook. Yeah. Right. Because you don't have anyone in your house as a kid who who disagrees mm-hmm. right politically. And so you just assume the other side is inherently evil. I mean, why wouldn't you assume that? So that is a real problem. And I love your example of the text because we all have these little moments, these little, you know, flashes with someone that we're in everyday conversation with where they say something that we didn't expect or that kind of rubs us the wrong way or, and, you know, it happened to me a few weeks ago, I was walking with a friend who I've known for years is a close friend of mine. And I made some comment about how it was about masks, actually. And it was about the mask because I 
when I, so DC is really uptight about wearing a mask, um, like really, really. And I go other places and it's like the opposite, it's like a different country. So, and, and depending on where I am, I take the other position. Like I'm just super argumentative that way. And uh, so, no, I mean, you know, whatever. So like there was a couple of times where I was running outside in DC during the pandemic and someone yelled at me for not wearing a mask. And in my mind, I was following the science. I was nowhere near them. It was outside, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we just, I just said something in passing and my friend said something that I didn't expect. And it was clear our, our, we had missed each other. We, we saw this differently. She saw it as considerate to wear a mask outside. I saw it as insanity (laughs) and, and I regretted it because I didn't, I should have said, Oh, this is really interesting. You know? Like you're someone I really love and respect mm-hmm. and we see this differently. Let's get into this. Like what, how could that be? Right. You know, like, what do you, why is it a sign of respect? And, you know, that was a missed opportunity, mm-hmm. you know, because I, what I wanted was I wanted to feel close to her. I yeah. didn't want to wedge between us. So I just slid right by mm-hmm. it and, you know, just moved to the next, I don't even know if she noticed it, you know, mm-hmm. but there are these moments, yeah. these little yeah. micro opportunities, yeah. right? That we should seize. And then you develop more comfort, I think. Absolutely. And you can come around because you have a relationship and say, you know what? You may not even, even notice this, but I said a thing and I really wanted to say this thing. And so then there's this thing, you know, and I have had, I am a, a I do not think before I speak Usually um, it's, it's like enduring 30% of the time and then 70, it's just oh, unfortunate. I a solid, yeah, I would flip that. <laughs> but, you know, we're, because a relationship is there, even ones that I would have thought were not as connected as they were, like you all were both saying, it was just enough that I could come back and say, and that person knew just enough about me. I needed to trust that they knew just enough to maybe absorb what I wanted to say, but there was also yeah. that consequence there, you know, but that yeah. you can go back to your friend and say, you know what, when I was saying that, because it's a good point. The humility of all of that is, is yeah, it's disarming is significant, but as someone who's a pro at apologizing a lot, <laughs> you know, that, that, and then that fosters some things potentially. Right. Totally. Right. And it makes it okay to, have these hiccups yeah. and circle back. Yeah, no, I think that is something that I need to practice doing in real time, right? Mm-hmm. When when it's not a, a workshop across a political divide, like that's one thing, right? <laughs> but you know, when it's just every day, getting curious in those moments is so hard and so mind-blowing, awesome. you know? Even my husband will say something, you know, like kind of that I think is maybe not so uh, enlightened. Yeah. Not that that ever happens once in a <laughs> while. And my immediate re- reaction is to try to correct him. Yeah. Intuitive, right? Yeah. Like rebuke, yeah. correct, to put him. A human yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, we have enough, again, we have enough of a relationship where I can do that. It's not going to escalate, you know, right. but it also doesn't. I, I I haven't learned anything, right? you know, like right. maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, I'm, but we it's, confess that. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't said, wow, I'm surprised that you say that. What makes you say that? And it doesn't mean I'm going to change my mind. I'm not, you know, right. Most likely right. <laughs> reminds me of the five to one ratio you talked about that good relationships mm. have five good positive interactions to the one conflictual one. And that seems to kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we don't have enough of those. So we really are out of time. I've got one question that I want to, final question that I want to ask from someone I know and respect, Kami, who is the executive director of the USC Center for Political Future, where they're doing extraordinary work. And his question is, given the challenges of so much disinformation and mistrust circulating in our country, what sustains your work and gives you hope? And I'm going to say something that sustains our work and give us hope um, while you're thinking of your answer. And that is people like Kami. And you, I think that the average citizen doesn't understand that there is just this rising up of 
of people and new organizations and efforts and people yeah. are changing jobs to essentially hold up an end of trying to f- help us find our way back to each other again. Mm-hmm. And it is extraordinary and it makes me happy and hopeful every time I get to meet new people doing that work. Well said. That's a great answer. Yeah. I mean, I too, I, I have this deep belief that there is a huge, just a huge unmet demand for a different kind of politics, a different kind of journalism, a different kind of conflict. Yeah. And people are just waiting. You know, they are just, they, the more in common, the research firm calls it the exhausted majority. And I think that's, that's right. Mm. So what gives me hope day to day these days is, I mean, the great thing about writing a book is you spend all this time trying to find stories and then you write the book and the stories come to you. So people have been sending me these really lovely notes about ways in which they're trying to disrupt conflict in their own lives or corners of the world. And there are all these people just kind of like counterculturally pushing against the grain, like trying, you know, uh, a, a state legislator in Vermont who's trying not to get sucked into us versus them politics, right? She's just trying mightily every single day. And it's awesome to, to see, you know, and it's hard. Um, a, a, ca- a Republican county commissioner in North Carolina, I was just talking to you yesterday about, uh, who's really worried about his community because they're not getting vaccinated, you know, and he's just trying everything he can think of. And the best part is he remains curious. Like he literally is like, I wish I could get inside their heads and understand. Like he's not just yeah. assuming he knows. Right. So there are these people who are really engaged in good conflict, like all the time. And so they give me a lot of hope. This book gives me a lot of hope. And uh, someone for our team today said they were going to really miss this book and they're going to have to read it <laughs> fast because it, it, it really is yeah. incredibly hopeful and positive. And I, I think that you've given us a recipe for what we walk towards and how we get there. And, and I think it can change the world. We just need to get it in the hands of every human on the planet. <laughs> That's good, right? We can do that, Amanda? Easy. Yeah, I think that can Amazon can make that happen. <laughs> and in the meantime, look, I just want to turn it around and say that you all have been doing this work since before I realized it was a problem. You, you know, the, and I look back at those notes, it's prescient. I mean, and the things you said then are like a hundred times more salient today. So keep doing what you're doing. Know that you are not alone. And there are more and more of us out there who realize. We need to stop being manipulated by uh, our leaders, by people who are just trying to exploit the conflict that we're in and divide us. This is, you know, the history of this country is we've been turned on each other over and over again. And we need to we need to say enough, you know, and start um, realizing that we're being manipulated and not let ourselves get sucked into this this toxicity. Amen. Vita, any closing thoughts? No, I'm just thrilled. And I think one of the things that I'm most hopeful and encouraged about is that, you know, we're we're in, you know, a space where, and I think we have been for a long time, but you know, the 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 negative, the caustic stuff is what is selling. And people think that the um the antidote or what what is a, a really um, terrible antidote is is fluffy sort of emotional responses like we're talking about. Right. So it, if it's not, it's either going to be a story about a rescued puppy or it's going to be the worst thing possible <laughs> going on in state legislature. Right. But that the positive, purposeful, healthy conflict, all of these things we're talking about are worthwhile, weighty, valuable things that can capture people's attention. And that that's a place that people are presuming it's either one side or the other. So if I say something and somebody's starting to dismiss it as feel good, right? There's a numbness that's happened there mm-hmm. for them not to be able to see that the stuff we're talking about is not the same as just, did you see the kitty calendar, right? But that people are beginning to thaw out from that and be able to see that this is really worthwhile, important stuff that can capture you emotionally and intellectually, just like the things that are very negative and of concern that kind of draw you in like the train wreck kind of thing, that there are things that are equally as magnetic, but not a train wreck. 
Um, and something like your book and these kinds of conversations are, are not only beneficial for me, but then I'm able to go and share them with people and it piques their interest that there are more things going on than they realize. So that is very well said. Yeah. It's, we've gotten stuck in this belief. It's either this or that. And, and there's a whole nother dimension. Yeah. What a joy it has been. Thank you all for joining us on behalf of the Village Square and more time. communities and the Tallahassee Democrat. We'd like to thank you for hanging out with us. It was lots of fun. Uh, we hope you'll come back September 30th for the second in our UNAM America Reignited series with Harvard University's Dr. Danielle Allen, author of Our Declaration. And that will be facilitated by Dr. Nasheed Madhuan, the Executive Director of Florida Humanities. So to everyone, have a wonderful evening and thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you both so much. Take care. Take care. Hi again, it's Vanessa here, your podcast host. Are y'all ready to run out and buy High Conflict right now? Or maybe just reread it like me. Yep, I was that team member who said they were going to miss this book. And I meant it 1000%, you guys. I loved every single minute of it. I listened to it on Audible. It's read by Amanda, which is just perfect. And because I already missed the book and this conversation with these three brilliant ladies, I can't say goodbye to them just yet. So I have a surprise for you. Here's a short clip from the pre-show, a little behind the scenes moment from when they were just chatting, waiting for the program to start. Something I've been playing with a lot, and I'd love to kind of get your both of your thoughts on it is it's not in the book, but just a way of thinking about all of this is like, I increasingly feel like anything you do in a high conflict situation, any intuitive thing you do makes it worse. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so diabolical, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what? It seems like you have to do the counterintuitive thing. Like you have to do the thing you really most, at least at first, don't want to do. Mm -hmm. That's a really um, good point. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, I, just think about if there are examples that occur to you. Maybe it's not true all the time, you know, but like I was just did this podcast with a um, school superintendent whose relationship with his teachers mm -hmm. union is like really frayed after the past year and a half, as you might imagine. And we actually had Gary on as the expert on conflict, the guy in the book who runs for office who, you know, gets sucked into high conflict. And he was telling him, you know, when you have to make a hard decision, like about masks or vaccines, and it's going to be unpopular, like you're going to be hated no matter what you do. It's important to show vulnerability, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do. Like you want to be like, I am the authority. And mm -hmm. here is what we're going to do. You don't want to reveal any weaknesses or see, let them see you sweat. But in fact, it's the opposite. And if you say, I'm really struggling with this decision, and I, it's just like, there is no right answer. And on the one hand, I see this. On the other hand, on the third hand, it tends to go a lot better. So anyway, that's just a little thing I've been because thinking about. Crazy, yeah, these crazy magic things when you do it that way, that all of a sudden everybody has space for each other and it moves in the opposite direction. I mean, we one of the things that, I mean, I loved about talking about you, but boy, this book was just it, it, so often, Amanda, we spend a lot of time saying, no, no, that's not what you do. We're, you know, talking about the facts and figuring out policy, that's never going to get where you, where you're going to go. You're never going to agree. And that isn't the magic that happens. And, and, and so often through these 15 years, we spend time talking to people and your book was like, yes, 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 that's it. You, you've nailed it from our perspective, which of course. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Hey there. So I wanted to play that for you guys because listen to this. I got drug into the tar pits just yesterday and I used this counterintuitive thing to get me out and it worked. So here's the deal. First, the tar pit. I really just still can't even believe I let myself get trapped because this happened on Facebook, the worst place to interact in high conflict. And I totally knew better. A guy I went to high school with posted something, and then in the comments, there was all sorts of misinformation. Of course, I should have just kept scrolling, but I had a serious lapse in judgment. 
I thought I could simply post a link with a nice comment. You know, just like Amanda told us, I thought I was being of service to these people who were misinformed. Well, they didn't take it that way. Also, like Amanda told us. So the guy I went to high school with turned nasty on me, like right away. It was like we were looking at the same thing. And I was saying it was purple. And he was saying it was yellow. And by the way, it was purple. So while I'm sitting there just trying to simply say, no, you see, it's purple. On his side, he was insulting me and laughing at me while insisting it was yellow. Then he posted a graphic that he made that morning on the fly to insult me with my name on it. That's when I realized I had been drug into the tar pit. So to get out, I did the counterintuitive thing. I complimented him. I told him I had such great memories of growing up with him and remembered him as a kind and funny guy. And so I was really disappointed at how this conversation was going. And then I told him I'd seen his car recently out of the soccer fields and wished that I'd see it again so we could sit down and have a real and respectful chat in person. That is what changed the dynamic. He immediately backed down, deleted the graphic, and wrote something sort of nice. Amanda, this counterintuitive thing is brilliant. Looking forward to trying it again, but not on Facebook next time. What I also think is brilliant is Amanda's closing comment about how we're all being manipulated. I had a conversation with someone important in my life who is politically opposite from me, and we navigated some very tricky ground, and I think we did very well, actually, hearing each other and learning some things and agreeing to disagree. But check this out. At the end of the conversation, I closed with, you know, I think the saddest part is how manipulated we all are by forces who care about their own self-interests. And I didn't really know how this was going to go over because I thought that she might just take it as a really crafty way of me telling her that she was manipulated. Well, nope. This was the thing we agreed on the most, like by far the most, could not agree more on. And, you know, I do assume that she thinks I'm the manipulated one. But even still, we can learn from that. If we're both sitting here thinking that the other person is manipulated, what really might be going on here? All right, that's enough for me. We'd like to close out by giving a huge thank you to Florida Humanities for partnering with us to present this podcast series, Created Equal and Breathing Free which will air right here on Village Squarecast through the end of the year. To stay up to date with all that's happening at the Village Square, subscribe to our newsletter at villagesquare.us. Finally, thanks to Carrie Roth and Wellington Meffert for their support of our work at the Village Square. And to all of you, we appreciate you listening to High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon. And thank you so much for listening to Village Squarecast. Cast.